Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Alyssa. This is Stefan. Uh, we are from the view in Amsterdam. It's actually, so last year during hardware.io, I was kind of torn because we were actually looking at the bugs we we're going to discuss at the time. But there's also like the hardware CTF and all of the talks and stuff. And I was really torn, you know, do I work on these uh, proof of concept exploits or do I actually go and interact with the conference? And I decided to interact with the conference and I don't regret it. Uh, even though I didn't get much sleep that week. But yeah, we're going to talk about uh, some bugs we found, and we're gonna, but also we're going to put them in the context of how basically everything is broken. Doom and despair. So we're going to kind of uh, start by saying we're going to be talking about CPUs today. We're going to be talking about the fancy, complicated CPUs. But we're going to pretend that they look something like this. We have a bunch of CPU cores, there's some other stuff, maybe there's some RAM, which you can roll hammer, maybe there's lots of buses, interconnects, which are completely broken. We're going to pretend those don't exist for today, so or at least that they're super functional and they work and there are no bugs. And we're going to be talking about the cloud, because that's kind of the threat model here. We've done something kind of crazy, which is that we kind of decided that these CPUs are amazing, they're everywhere, we have them in our phones and computers and stuff, and that's kind of okay. But then we started thinking, well, we can just put you know, these CPUs in servers, and then we can share these servers. And that's fine, right? I mean, shared resources, this couldn't cause any problems, because we have these isolation mechanisms. So we started out with these uh, processes, and we have containers, but you know, to make us feel safe at night, we have these virtual machines. And these virtual machines make us pretend, you know, we have our kind of our own computer, or if, you know, we don't quite have our own computer, at least we're separated sufficiently from our neighbors. And basically, we've trusted these CPUs to isolate these virtual machines. We just pretend we get our own computers. And this is a, actually a really, really bad idea not just because of the bugs we found, but because CPUs are just not that perfect. They're just full of errata, full of these bugs. And it's like, okay, you know, we've been picking on Intel, we're gonna be picking on Intel, it's gonna be fun. But, you know, what about the other manufacturers? Well, you can look at these errata sheets that say, you know, what kind of bugs do you see in these CPUs? Do you have like one or two minor bugs in your CPUs? So I picked a completely random ARM processor, and it's like, okay, this is one page of the table of contents of the bug list. There are a lot of pages of the table of contents, never mind the bugs themselves. And it's like, what about AMD? Well, it turns out they have lots of bugs too. For instance, uh, you might have recently have heard about the RD RAND bug, where I think after a sleep, AMD's RD RAND would just always return zeros. It just wouldn't work anymore. These things are really complicated. And it's like, but these are all fixed, right? I mean, these get fixed really quickly. So I took uh, a few days ago, Intel updated one of the errata for their latest CPU, and their table of contents is really nice because you can't quite, probably can't quite see it here, but on the left side here, there's a column, is it fixed or not? This is all no fix. They're also apparently not so good at making PDFs. Anyway, so, what we're actually gonna talk about today is CPU pipelines. So as I was saying, we're going to ignore the rest of these CPUs, but we're going to talk about how even if you don't care about all the bugs in the rest of the chip, we're still blindly trusting these CPU pipelines. Because these pipelines are actually on the bus. They have access to everything. And we're just kind of saying, okay, we're going to imagine these isolations exist, that the CPU pipeline is somehow going to isolate us from the thing, even though there's really nothing actually enforcing that isolation other than the hopes of the CPU designers and of everyone using the cloud. And there's a thing called speculative execution, which broke everyone's threat models a few years ago. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with speculative ex execution. I imagine most of you, but I'm just going to go through this very quickly so you understand what we're talking about later. So I have a simple example program and it does some computation, and then we have a branch which says, okay, did this computate, was this computation actually finished? If it was, we're gonna do something with this, otherwise we're gonna throw an error. This is kind of very typical code, and it turns out that we want our computers to run really quickly. So what we're actually gonna do, we're gonna do the computation, and then we're just gonna assume it was fine, so this if statement, we're just gonna use a branch predictor, and we're gonna say, let's assume we always go down this okay path, 
we do the do X thing because it always happens that way. And it means we can already get started executing this code before um, we need to worry about it, did the computation actually finish? So kind of the timeline looks like this. So we do the computation, but at the same time as the computation, we already get started on the code after the computation. And well, this is speculative. That's why speculative execution. We just hope that it works out. And if it doesn't work out, that's absolutely fine because we just throw away the results and go back to the other error path. The problem, as Stefan will discuss in a minute, is that actually there are side effects to these paths. Using the cache, using other mechanisms, and we can actually see what's going on here. And this is a real problem in some cases. And Meltdown really brought this home because it turns out you can do this trick, which is just instead of the computation, you do let's read some memory. And then the CPU internally just says, well, we're just going to assume you are allowed to read that memory. And that's fine. But it turns out if that memory is kernel memory, it will still do this. And that lets us leak kernel memory. And then we had the foreshadow attack, which let us do this with arbitrary physical memory. And what we're going to talk about is how Intel in particular has been just kind of piling patch on top of patch on top of patch. But it turns out these issues are absolutely everywhere. And this issue, in general, we call exception deferral. Because what it, what's even more serious about this is that when I say, you know, it throws it away, this bit, it turns out in the case of exceptions, actually this code just is allowed to kind of finish. But we'll talk about that more in a bit. As I said, we're going to pick on Intel. And the reason we're doing this is because they're super popular and they have a bounty program. We're not doing this just because Intel CPUs are necessarily the most broken. They certainly seem pretty broken. But the real worry is these bugs are probably everywhere. And I'm hoping to encourage more people to look at these issues because I think the stuff we found, it's not that hard to find. It's just people are not looking. We just really have blind faith in these pipelines. Intel CPUs, uh, I took a diagram from a modern chart. It kind of looks like this. But it turns out this is just a more complicated way of doing this kind of diagram. You have these CPU cores. It's connected by a mesh rather than a ring. But we're going to pretend it looks something like this. So this is going to be super simple, right? But then, if you open up one of these CPU cores, there's a pipeline inside, and this pipeline is super complicated. And we're going to look at a few bits of this. We'll get some zoomed-in versions later that you can actually see the details of. And we're going to talk about one class of bugs, the microarchitectural data sampling attacks, which is a very nice name to say microarchitectural data means your data in the pipeline. And sampling means reading. You know, if you can sample something, then we have your data. And these were in the news recently. So Riddle and Zombie Load and Fallout, because everyone loves these fancy names. There was a lot of news coverage. Oh, help. What did I press? Hey. Um, but first, Stefan is going to talk a bit about cache attacks. And then we'll go into some technical details about how Riddle actually works. Great. So let's first talk about some uh, cache attacks. Um, so as you may know, um, so um, and 20 years ago or something, we just used to have like CPU registers and main memory and um, disk storage. And one of the issues is that, well, CPU advances quite quickly. So we um, eventually we uh, broke the gigahertz barrier for that. Well, main memory is usually slacking behind. Um, so how do we solve this? So we put like three caches in between. So level one cache, level two cache, level three cache that are basically smaller memory components that are much faster. Um, so as you can see here, so the, the, the lower you get, so closer to the disk storage, the larger it is, but it's also slower. Um, the higher you get, so up to the CPU registers, the smaller uh, it is, but also the much faster it is. Um, and one of the noticeable things is like um, now, if we talk about um, loading data, it means it can come from main memory or from the cache, and preferably the cache. And one of the issues, so one of the um, terminologies uh, we use for this is like, if it's not in the cache, it's called a cache miss, and it's slow. And if it's, um, well, if it is actually in the cache, then we call it a cache hit and it's fast. And this is something we actually use for cache attacks, because if we now reverse this idea of like, um, you, you can actually time your load. So you can actually time your load, and then you can see if it's in the cache or not. So like, if the load, if, if you time the load and it uh, takes I've, I've like 10 cycles, for instance, then you know it's in the cache. 
if it takes about 300 cycles, for instance, you know it's in main memory. And using this, we can infirm, infirm some behavior from, for instance, other programs, what they're doing. Okay, so I have some code here. Um, on the top you see, so it consists of three parts. On the top you see a, a flush. On the, in the second part you see the victim that's trying to do something with an array. And in the third part you see um, the reload, and this is actually the timing part I was talking about earlier, um, where it tries to actually do the load and time the load to see if it's in the cache or not. And then um, the attacker also has this uh, nice probe array that's also shared, happens to be shared a bit with the victim. Um, and what you're going to do in the first step is actually quite easy. We start flushing this entire way to make sure that it all is out of the cache and actually has to be loaded from DRAM. Now the victim starts doing some computation, preferably some table where it uses a secret as an index. And what it means is that, well, it loads um, some index, which is a secret, and you can actually enter the, enter the cache. So that next time, um, if it tries to load the same secret again, it's fast, of course. And then in the third step, um, we actually are back at the attacker, and the attacker starts timing every entry in the proper way. So the first one, access, it's from DOM, so it's slow. The second one, access, it's from DOM, it's slow. The third one, access, hey, it's fast, so it's in the cache. So now the attacker knows something about what the victim did. It actually knows um, which sec what the secret index is. So um, previous attacks you might have seen uh, over the years are uh, Meltdown, Spectre, and Foreshadow. And um, for this talk, I'm just going to focus a bit more on, on uh, Meltdown, um, and but also talk a bit sometimes about Spectre and Foreshadow. Um, so if we go back to our, our usual cache attack, um, with Meltdown, we have an additional bit. So um, we have now four components, and the flush and reload should be similar, and new parts here like the victim and, and uh, the Meltdown step. So the first step, um, what happens is that you have some kernel, and it's, you, you can convince it to load some per kernel address. And what will happen is, well, it will load it into the L1D cache. So then, as an attacker, we flush the proper way, so we start flushing all these entries again. They're now uh, all, in, all away from the cache. And then we have the meltdown part. And this, what happens here is it runs in a transaction. So as Alyssa mentioned before, this runs speculatively. So what happens here is speculatively, we will try to read this kernel address. And then we actually leak the kernel data from the level one D cache. Because, well, the permission check hasn't happened yet. So, ah, it will just do that. And then, um, what we do is like we do some calculation to um, use this value that we found as an index into the proper way, and then we simply load an entry in a proper way. So now we have the the the, uh, the secret. Well, not the secret itself loaded, but the, the the secret is used as an index, so this entry got loaded. And now what we can do as an attacker, we can start timing all of these entries in the proper way again. So we try the first one, well, DRAM, second one, DRAM, but the third one is fast because it's in the cache. And now we actually know what the um, index is, and hence we know the value that we leaked um, from the kernel. So we have some mitigations against these things. Um, one of them is kernel page table isolation, and that's the primary one against um, Meltdown. So um, what's the idea behind kernel page table isolation? Well, the problem is, of course, um, well, we leak kernel data from virtual addresses. So what do you do? Well, we introduce two address spaces. One for the kernel, where the kernel is mapped in and the user space is mapped in, and one for user mode, where you have like just user space and a few kernel pages to switch between these two. So now the kernel addresses are mapped, so you cannot uh, speculatively read these anymore. So now we uh, assume we have a system um, like a, a year, about a year ago with all the mitigations in place after Meltdown, Spectre, um, Foreshadow. So um, we have this uh, system in our office. It has like an Intel Core i7 7800X CPU. And then if we look at the bugs, you see it is vulnerable for uh, Meltdown, Spectre Variant 1, Variant 2, the SOAR Bypass L1TF, which is also known as Foreshadow. And then what we do is like, okay, we look a bit at CPU info, and we see like, okay, we have um, the latest microcode. It's up to date. We have all the um, mitigations installed. So what can we still do as an attacker? Well. So here's uh, our riddle program. So um, in the first line, you see like you have this ad set or a shadow file, and what it contains are like the Unix users you have on your system with the, um, with the password hashes. And as a normal user, you cannot access this file because, well, you would get permission denied. If you use root, you can actually see the file, and then you'll see that the first line is usually the uh, password hash for the root account. And what you see on the third line is basically or uh, one of our proof of concepts 
where we actually um, use Riddle to leak um, the, 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 fir the password hash that uh, is, corresponds with the root account. So meet Roganfly data load or Riddle. And what I'm going to show you today is that Riddle is really a new class of speculative execution attacks that knows no boundaries. So what do I mean knows no boundaries? Well, privilege levels, as we have discussed before, so kernel, virtual machine, blah, 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 they're just a social construct. So what I've shown you in, with this proof of concept here is that, well, you can just leak between uh, hardware threads, also known as Intel hyperthreading. Um, but the question is, of course, can we leak across any of the other security domains? So like in a typical CPU, you now have like um, the kernel, you have uh, the user space, you might have m many more VMs, you have hypervisor managing these VMs, and you might have some secure enclaves that just don't trust anything in the system. So the answer turns out to be, yes, we can. So we can leak from the kernel, um, we leak across VMs, even from the hypervisor, and also from SGX enclaves. We actually leak across all the security domains. So another question you might have then is like, okay, now you have these nice security domains, so fine, whatever, you can leak from a virtual machine, but can you actually leak in the web browser? Turns out we can. So we actually reproduce a little in Mozilla Firefox, and what this means is that there's no need for any special CPU instructions um, that you would typically, typically find for these uh, cache attacks. So we leak across uh, security domains and in the browser. Another social construct I want to talk to, uh, to you to, uh, about today are memory addresses. So we've seen these previous attack a bit, and what they show is that we can speculatively leak from addresses. And what this means is that um, what, we, what happens with the mitigations effort is that we actually focus on these addresses. So we try isolating or masking addresses to prevent spe um, people from using speculative execution to read these addresses because if they're not available, well, there's nothing you could do, right? So um, to give some ex uh, uh, examples here, so Spectre accesses out of bound addresses, uh, Meltdown is able to leak kernel data from virtual addresses, and Foreshadow leaks um, data from physical addresses. And what you see is that um, the mitigations, what do they do? Well, for Spectre, they just try to mask their way index to limit the address range such that you cannot um, access all out-of-bound addresses. With Meltdown, we just unmap the kernel addresses from the user space, and with Foreshadow, we actually invalidate the physical addresses. So previous attacks, they exploit addressing, and this means that our mitigation mostly focuses on isolating or masking these addresses. Riddle, on the other hand, does not depend on addressing. So um, what this means is that it bypasses all address-based security checks that we have in place now. And this means that it also makes Riddle hard to mitigate. So one of the questions is, of course, what CPUs does Riddle affect? Well, so what we did is we bought Intel and AMD CPUs from almost every generation since 2008. And we sent the invoices to a professor, Herbert Boss, who's um, fortunately enough for him not in the room. And we built this nice IKEA rack with um, all the architectures and a nice cable mess here uh, that we sometimes call the fire hazard uh, in our building. And what we found is that Rill actually works on all mainstream um, Intel CPUs since 2008. So here's the list of CPUs that we tested this on. And then at some point, um, we looked at the Intel website and they announced a new generation. So uh, what Intel announced here is Coffee Lake Refresh. And what they promised is in silicon mitigations against Meltdown and Fortune. And this is super interesting for us because we just found this new vulnerability. So let's see how does it actually work on one of these. So we decided like, okay, let's buy the uh, Core i9 9900K. And we sent another invoice to Professor Herbert and we got it today basically after we submitted the paper to um, SMP Oakland. And what we found is that this CPU is also uh, vulnerable. Then we also tried to reproduce it on AMD. Well, apparently AMD didn't make the same mistake here. They made some, they, they probably made some other mistakes, who knows. Um, but what we found is we tested on three CPUs but couldn't reproduce a uh, riddle. And this is also the um, uh, covered in the media cover press release back then. So riddle inside, it runs great on Intel. And the question is, where are we actually leaking from? So um, remember the diagram at the beginning again, very com CPUs are very complex. And what you see here is a part of the pipeline that's mostly responsible for like um, all the memory requests. And we, we've seen the previous attacks, they had it easy, they're like cache, the cache attacks, so they just focus on leaking from caches. So the level two cache here and the level one D cache here are highlighted. Um, and well, they're easy to do because caches are generally well documented and well understood. Um, 
the problem we had is that RHEL does not leak from caches at all. So what else is there to leak from? So there are these other internal CPU buffers. So we got um, the line fill buffers um, at the top. On the right, you have the load ports. Um, and then and on the bottom, you have the store and forward buffer, for instance. And there's more. There's also um, the memory control. So if you map uncached memory, um, then you can also leak that. So we find that we can leak from various internal CPU buffers. Okay. And then um, what this shows is that Riddle is actually a class of speculative execution attacks and um, that Intel refers to as MDS or microarchitectural data sampler. Um, and for this talk, I'm just going to focus on one particular instance, which are the line fill buffers. So, well, where do we find information about these things? So like, the, like I said before, caches are, are well understood and well documented. And we first tried to read, read the manuals to find more information about these internal buffers. Turns out there are some references to them, but no further explanation. So this is an excerpt from the Intel manual, and this is one of the very few ones you'll find talking about um, the, the actual line fill buffers. So no further explanation. Where would you actually start? So that's why we started this uh, reading patterns instead. And these are all the um, patterns we read for this paper. And we have survived, so I'm here to talk a bit more about this. And of course, you're still wondering, what are these line fill buffers ex exactly? So these line build buffers, they sit very central here. So you have the caches and the uh, execution units. And the line fill buffer is right here in the middle, and it ex actually exists um, to improve memory throughput. So how does it do that? Well, it has uh, multiple responsibilities, so it can does a synchronous memory request, it does load squashing where uh, multiple loads are combined if it can be done. Uh, optional white combining where it does the same for stores. And also uncached memory where you don't want to use the cache, but you have to keep the data somewhere. And what we're going to focus on uh, here is just the asynchronous memory request. So um, so let's say you're a CPU designer. Um, one issue you have is like, okay, what should I do on a cache mix? So one thing you can do is you can send out a memory request. You can wait for the DRAM to come back, but it takes like 200, 300 cycles. And this means you're basically blocking other loads and source you're, you're preventing the CPU from resuming execution. So what's the solution? Well, you introduce the LFV, you keep track of the address. So you send out a memory request, you allocate an entry in your LFV, you store the address in the line fill buffers. And then in the meanwhile, while this uh, DRAM request is still um, and being processed, you can do other work. So you can serve the other loads and source in your pipeline. Uh, even from um, the cache if you have that available in the cache. And then at some point, your pending memory request eventually completes. What the problem really is here is to allocate LFV entry part. So um, what's the problem here is that the allocate LFV entry, it means that if you don't zero it out, it may still contain data from a previous load. And this is exactly the part that will exploit. So, we've, um, so in our paper, we have some experiments that show this. And the conclusion from these experiments, what we found is that Riddle, um, this uh, Riddle instance actually leaks from the line fill buffers. Um, so now Alyssa is going to talk to you more about how to do higher level stuff, so how to actually mount a Riddle attack. Thank you. So I hope you have some idea already. Uh oh, this is not great. You can leak the shadow file. It's really not great. Uh, a bunch of you may have already uh, understood this because you got these microcode updates and the operating system patches and you noticed the performance hit. But you know, what are we actually doing here? You know, I mean, are these attacks realistic? So to do these attacks, you know, what we're doing is we're leaking in-flight data. So what do we want to do? Well, we want some kind of sensitive data, right? You know, and we're not going to start digging in silicon as much fun as it would, that would be. I'd much rather be doing that. So we're going to start by thinking, okay, you have this local attacker threat model. So you have some code, you know, maybe running in a web browser, but we're going to say, okay, someone's foolishly given you a login to their VM, to their home computer, or you have some kind of exploit. What can we do if we really get to run code locally as a normal user? So we're going to try and grab the contents from earlier of the shadow file with all of the password hashes. We want that root password hash. How do you actually go about that? It's like, how do you actually get this into memory? Well, if you want S-trace on password, you just run the password utility. You discover that even before it asks you for a password or it needs it, it opens the shadow file and starts reading from it, which is great for our purposes. So. We're going to do a confused deputy attack, which is to say we're going to use the password utility to read shadow for us. You know, thanks so much for set UID. 
password opens this file, so what do we need to do? You know, well, can we somehow get this to do it on another hyperthread so we can grab stuff from its line fill buffer? And it turns out, yep, we can just set the process affinity. We just run a shell script with task set, and we can pin it to any core we want. And what do we put in the script? We literally just do this, you know, while true, one password. It's a shell script, you know? This is not the most super efficient approach. You know, you could probably optimize this, run it in C, something that calls it repeatedly, tries to make sure there's a bunch of them running, but we don't care. So we have three challenges we're going to look into here. And the first one, well, we have the password utility. Shadow is right there in flight. That's absolutely great. So the next thing is leaking data. It's like, wait a minute. You know, how does this riddle thing actually work? You know, what does this look like? Well, I hopefully it's a bit familiar now. We have this. We're going to do this flush. We're going to have a riddle step, and then we're going to do the reload. So hopefully you know what the flush looks like. We're just going to get rid of all the cache entries for our probe array. Then we have this riddle step. And what we're going to do, a bit magic, we're going to just read from a null pointer. We're just going to read from an invalid pointer. There are actually a whole bunch of ways to do this. You just have to confuse the CPU in a way where it tries to do a load that it can't satisfy for the cache, and then something goes wrong. You have this exception thing going on. You could also do it with demand paging, which we'll get back to a, a bit later. So this is actually the normal kind of thing which happens a lot. And we're just going to do the access to the probe array as an index, and then we're just going to do this reload step. So it's like, yeah, slow, 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 but it's fast, so this is byte three. It's like, but wait a minute, byte three? What is that in ASCII? Oh. So the problem is, yeah, riddle is like drinking from a fire hose. You get everything. Everything is going through these internal buffers. These line field buffers, these load ports, these store buffers, you get absolutely everything. There's way too much, you know? By the time we've actually finished running this whole loop, there's been huge amounts of other data that have gone through these buffers. But the great thing is, yeah, we get whatever data is in flight, but as long as we can do it repeatedly, like running the password utility in a loop, all of that data is going to come past at some point. The question is, you know, how do we get the right data? If we get a free, that's definitely not a valid ASCII character, that's not the kind of thing we're expecting to see. So what can we do? So there are two things you can do. So one of which is synchronizing. So you can do all these fancy cache attacks to say, okay, we want this code to run really slowly in the password utility see when it's reading this file. So we're going to do, we're going to evict the code of the password utility from the cache. Okay, this is way too complicated already. We're lazy. Nowadays, there's actually a great library to do this, but at the time, there wasn't. So instead, we're just going to say, okay, can we do a hack? So instead, post-processing. So okay, we just repeat measurements a lot. Can we kind of somehow take a lot of measurements and just stitch together the ones we want? Because that would be absolutely great. And, you know, the third uh, uh, um, option, apparently, is to do kind of advanced statistical analysis using machine learning. And this was Intel's uh, perspective, what they were telling all the vendors. If you look at the official press releases, you need to do all these advanced statistics. Turns out you don't need advanced statistics. How are we going to actually do the, filter, the filtering? Well, we want to leak from the shadow file, and we know the first line is for root. It's cache aligned, which is absolutely perfect. And actually, it starts with root colon. So we're just going to say, OK, every time the line fill buffer comes by, if it starts with root colon, that sounds exactly what we want. And you can do this once we learn the next byte. So we're grabbing byte by byte in this flush reload. Every time we learn a new byte, and that gives us more and more of a prefix to match on. So we have this root colon. So let's look at the line fill buffer. It says HTTPS. Nope, no match. It says we call on something. Oh, we have another byte. We're just going to do one byte at a time because, I mean, this data is coming by again and again and again, and we want to be fast and efficient. Read me, no match. You get another byte, another byte, another byte. So you, and you build this stuff up. So it turns out, actually, this problem is really easily solvable. And it turns out that you can leak the root hash, password hash from an unprivileged user. In our paper, we wrote 24 hours to do this. We were, um, way overcomplicating this. We were too lazy to rerun the experiment. We gave it to a master student recently, and he's like, yeah, it takes like 10 seconds in my experiments. Turns out, yeah, you can leak this in 10 seconds. You can probably leak it even faster. But, okay, let's try extending this a bit. What can we do with this? Well, you, the local attacker model is not very realistic. If you're running code on my machine, I probably have bigger problems. But there's this whole cloud thing, which I mentioned in the first place. And it turns out that, okay, the big cloud providers certainly at this point 
hyperthreading, you're not going to get shared hyperthreads. Unless you don't want to pay that much. If you want to cheap, you know, to run stuff cheaply, then you still get these, um, these shared hyperthreads. If you're with a cheap cloud provider, they still do this. So the thread model is going to be we have a victim VM in the cloud and somehow we co-locate on the same server an attacker VM. And it doesn't always have to be on the opposite hyperthread, as long as it's sometimes on the opposite hyperthread. Because all we actually want is for, it, for this data to sometimes be in the line full buffer. I mean, we can be patient. We have to make sure it's still located sometimes, as I was saying, so we get these shared line full buffers. And then what do we do? Well, the victim VM is running an SSH server. This turns out to have the same problem. You connect to SSH, and what does it do? It optimistically says, well, this person is probably going to log in with a password. So let's read the shadow file. How do we get the data in flight? We just run an SSH client and connect a lot in a loop. Exactly the same trick. So again, we were doing this with a script that just actually SSHs into the server, kills the client process because we don't actually want to try logging in. And that SSH server is going to go, put this data in the line fill buffer, and then it's in flight, and we leak it with the same attack we were doing before. And then we have your shadow file. And this, in practice, it's fiddly, right? It's just, I have this feeling if I give this to enough master students, this will just magically happen in a second. But, you know, I'm kind of hoping you don't allow remote logins using root, so the root password may not be useful. Hopefully you don't even have a root password. But there's probably plenty of other confidential data on your servers, like your login keys, that you probably don't want to have in my hands. Okay, but fine. What else can we do? You know, do we have more cool tricks? It turns out, yes, we have more cool tricks. So this, we discussed already, there's this thing called Spectre. And Spectre basically just relies on tricking this branch predictor. Just can we kind of combine these techniques somehow? Can we do something clever? So one of our co-authors discovered, yes, you can. So we combine Riddle and Spectre. What we're going to do, we're going to somehow train this, train the branch predictor to trust us, to take the right path. And then we're going to surprise, oh, Suffice the branch predictor, I want to say an unexpected uh, branch, but an unexpected pointer. You'll see why in a second. What we're actually going to do is we're going to start calling system calls. And we're going to call a system call that loads some memory from user space. And it kind of optimistically assumes that, yes, the pointer you provided to me is a legitimate one from your user space program that you're allowed to read. And then we're going to say, haha, we're going to give you an arbitrary pointer to some random piece of kernel memory. And the branch predictor will just say, yeah, that's probably good and it will load it. This isn't mitigated by Spectre defenses because all you're doing is loading memory. You're not indexing an array or anything, but it does end up in the line fill buffers, and so Riddle lets us actually leak this value. So the way it works in practice is, in the kernel, you have this, um, in the Linux kernel, I should say, in this case, you have a function called copy from user, and it accesses an arbitrary user supply pointer. We don't care what it does with it. All we want to do is make sure it gets read. We repeatedly call a fast system call to train the branch predictor. You can trust us. This is always going to be valid. We're never going to take the error case. And then we give it a kernel pointer we want to leak, which can be actually a pointer into the FIS map so we can grab arbitrary physical memory. And it gets ex ex executed speculatively, and then we leak. And uh, in practice, it looks like this. Just we train it. We give, OK, let's call the system call with a valid pointer. And it happily says, OK, we're going to take this branch. It's going to be fine. And then we say, OK, you know, call it with a kernel pointer. And it says, well, it's probably going to be fine. Let's load it into the line fill buffer. So there are mitigations against this. They are in place. They're even in place on all operating systems nowadays. But it gives an idea of the real risks of depending on your CPU to do the right thing here. Everyone thought, OK. Spectre, we patched all the stuff that's important. You don't have any every indexes left. But it turns out, no, you just can't touch memory if you want to be safe. But so we still need a local account on the target for these kind of tricks. So what else can we do? Can we get, you know, all of your personal details? As we were discussing earlier, can we do this from the browser? It was a real question for a long time, actually, because we kind of depend on several things in our exploits. So ideally, we have these transactions or some other speculation mechanism, such as uh, tricking the branch predictor using return address patching. And you can't do that from JavaScript. It's super annoying. And you can't use invalid pointers from JavaScript either. So what is this? And it turns out you also can't just call CL flush, which is the efficient way to flush cache lines out of the cache, 
because, well, the browser vendors realized actually a long time ago this is a bad idea. So what we can do? Well, we have no CL flush, but we can just construct eviction sets and manually just push stuff out of the cache because there's no more space left. And we don't have TSX or invalid pointers, but it turns out if you just allocate a huge amount of memory, then it does, it, the operating system assumes you're not actually going to use all of that memory. So for example, I think in a Chrome sandbox, you, you still get several gigabytes, eight gigabytes or so of memory. You just allocate all of this, and then it doesn't actually generate page tables. So actually, every time you access this memory, you get a page fault, and the operating system goes, oh, that's an okay page fault. This is not a problem. We're going to give you some backing memory. But it turns out that from the pipeline's point of view, it's like, no, 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 this is a fault. This is just as bad as accessing a null, null pointer. We're going to abort. We're not going to give you real data. And it fills it from the line fill buffer speculatively. It's exactly what we want. It's absolutely perfect. So we wrote some code, and it looks like this. And it's just, you might think, okay, but we're talking about web browsers, right? This doesn't look like much like JavaScript. Well, the great news is the browser vendors have this thing called WebAssembly. And it turns out we don't even have to learn how to do this in JavaScript. It turns out we can just take the C code, generate it in WebAssembly. It's perfect. So what does it look like? I wish I had a beautiful live demo to show you. We don't have it working again. Um, but I can show you the boring command line version. I can even show it live. So we actually do this using the, uh, the Firefox JavaScript shell. And it literally just leaks. You know, it's not the fastest thing in the world. But we can show you a toy example. So what we're doing here is just on one thread, we have our own program that runs a mess, that displays a message, and on the other thread, we leak from JavaScript. Honestly, in the real world, it's not very clear if you can do anything super useful with a browser trick. If you can run SSH repeatedly, then yes, you can do something, but you probably don't have SSH open on your machine. We tried some games with cookies, but it turns out we only have so much patience. So I'm still hoping that someone will go and actually give this a go and see, is this, does this really have serious security impact? But it was kind of fun to do. There's a bunch more examples in our paper. You can leak from load ports, which is stale data in the pipeline, which actually doesn't even have to be in any of these buffers. You can leak from these SGX registers, which is Intel's kind of secure enclave system, but this is already, honestly, completely broken. And you can leak internal CPU data, because the great thing about being able to leak from these buffers is you can leak anything the CPU pipeline is reading. And it, leak, it reads page tables. It reads virtual machine status pages. It reads all kinds of stuff. So you can see everything going by. But OK, there are these mitigations. You all have these mitigations on your computers now. You know, you're, you're all safe. Well, so before May, before these disclosure, we had three mechanisms, one of which is you can just stop speculation. But you can only do that at certain points. And one of which is you can hide the secret using things like KPTI discussed earlier, or you can disable timers. And like I say the disable timers thing does not last. You can construct these timers. So our JavaScript demo actually does this using um, shared memory. And it turns out that for things like games and stuff, you really need these high performance counters. But the other two, yeah, these are in place in a lot of systems. But the bad news is these, these don't make any sense in the face of new um, vulnerabilities such as Riddle and MDS. So in May, they introduced two new mitigations, Intel did, and all the operating system vendors. So one of which is kind of the simplest approach you can think of, you're leaking from these buffers, so we just overwrite the buffers. You just stomp zeros all over these buffers. And as long as you're in the same thread, this is fine. You have beautiful pieces of assembly code like this, yeah, I mean, it hits your performance a little, having to do this all over the place, but it's for security. But the really bad news is that it doesn't matter if you're clearing the buffers if we're in the other hyperthread grabbing the buffers before you can clear them. And this means that you have two options, one of which is you can do some really complex scheduling. You can make sure that kind of the kernel, when it's in one thread in the kernel, the other thread is not in the kernel. Um, it turns out Intel have a beautiful document that looks like this. It's like, yeah, you can kind of make the scheduling work right. No, this is, this is never going to be implemented correctly. It's too complicated. It comes to too much performance hit. So if you want to be secure, the only real thing to do is to disable hyperthreading. You know, okay, on your desktop machines, you know, this is maybe not so important, but on servers, this is still a risk. Everyone's running with hyperthreading performance, but you know, this is this is kind of a crazy idea. Everyone's being very careful. Like your hypervisor doesn't load stuff from another virtual machine while your virtual machine is on one of the hyperthreads. 
if you're Amazon or Google um, or Microsoft, then yeah, sure, you can kind of implement this. And they all have implementations which might work. Who knows? We're not sure. But all the other cloud vendors, this is a big problem. So, and this is another example of what we like to call spot mitigations. So it's just a mitigation which just patches over one problem. It's literally just clearing the buffers here. And it clears all three kinds of buffers that we found. If there are more buffers in there that you can leap from, then this is not going to be a fix. And we can already see that also Intel tried patching these issues in silicon, right? They actually patched the meltdown issues so page faults are no longer valid, and it didn't work. And yeah, look at our diagram. Look at how complicated these things are. It's actually, you can zoom in to any of these things. There's a whole bunch of other things in, in a lot of these units. There are pretty many problems. And it's not just Intel, right? This, this is, you know, a lot of modern CPUs look like this, more complicated than this. So my take home message today is these issues need to be fixed, which means these issues need to be understood. And I really don't get the impression that many people at Intel understand these issues. Certainly, very few people outside Intel have any idea. I mean, I have no idea how some of this works. And if you are more interested in this whole CPU bug, this whole issue of CPU bugs in general, it's a really serious one. There was a great paper at Usenix, uh, among other pe people, some of the authors were from Intel, it's called Hard Fails. And I recommend, take a look at this. This gives an idea, not these kind of vulnerabilities, but all the other kind of vulnerabilities that you run into when you're trying to make CPUs. And it turns out, oh gosh, this is really hard. And our verification tools don't spot this stuff. And our engineers don't spot this stuff. And this stuff ends up left in CPUs. It's a really good paper. And the disclosure process, just to give an idea of how much fun this is, we're still talking to PCR. So we reported this last year, um, just before Hardware I.O., September the 12th. Uh, and they were like, yeah, that's great. You're the first academic finders. This is really serious. We'll definitely look at it. Uh, and then, okay, we're fine. We submit a paper to an academic conference under confidentiality. And then they come back in December and say, wait, there were already three people who actually found this before you, and we just forgot about them. Um, and then Georgie, who's a co-author on our paper, um, Volo and Dan, it turns out that Dan didn't find this. And he actually found the swap G G GS thing, which was in the news very recently. And then, um, yeah, I mean, unsurprisingly, um, Intel uh, in May said, oh, there were more finders. It turns out people are actively looking at this, not that many people, but there were more finders. For example, the zombie load uh, authors um, found uh, largely overlapping issues in April, I think. Um, you know, there were lots of people involved. I'm sure there were also people who did were not nice enough to disclose to Intel who have been taking advantage of these things. You can find more information on our website. If you haven't already looked at this, there's also a tool you can download um, that checks whether Intel's mitigations are in place and um, what Intel says about if your CPU is vulnerable or not. And just to conclude, so we kind of thought, okay, Spectre and certainly Meltdown, this is just bugs, it was just one issue. Okay, foreshadow. You know, this is not going to be a whole thing which keeps on giving for decades, right? Turns out, yeah, it is. We found a new class of speculative attacks here, leaking from a whole bunch of buffers. And the question is, how many bugs are left? You know, it's not a question is, are there more bugs, I think. The real question is just, how many of these things are left? How many of these things are going to be found over the next few years? And I'm hoping from some of you. Uh, so you can ping us on Twitter, and we have a website, and uh, I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Uh, have you tried these also on ARM CPUs? Okay, so the question was, uh, have we also tried these on ARM CPUs? So the problem with ARM is that um, we have some ARM uh, laptops at, at our uh, office. Um, I've played around a lot with them um, in the past. Um, but the problem, most of my ARM hardware is still 32 bits. And I think one of the biggest issues ARM has at this point is that it's completely fragmented. It's super hard to get um, any of the modern processors. And most of the modern processors of, like, that claim their ARM just support the uh, ISA um, just to decode instructions. Um, but the internal architecture is not from ARM itself. It's something custom usually. And it's very hard to get these um, servers, for instance. So it's like you start at the price of 10K. So we haven't been able to look at these yet. But if you'd like to donate them, 
Okay, thanks. Would be very helpful. Uh, okay. Any other questions? And I could expand. And so one interesting thing is that so these class of bugs, ARM has been vulnerable to at least the rogue system register load bugs, where they were speculatively allowing access to confidential registers in some CPUs. You have some power systems which were vulnerable to meltdown style attacks. Um, you have AMD systems, which apparently don't check the segment registers very carefully. Thankfully for AMD, no one uses registers for this kind of security anymore. But these bugs are definitely everywhere. It's just a question of people are really looking for them on Intel. So it looks like we don't have any other questions. You can um, talk to the speakers during the break. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Alyssa.